Okay, we are rolling now. Counting us down. Three, two. You're listening to Missing Out with Lex Michael and Tari J. Let's start the show. Hey guys, welcome back to Missing Out. I'm Tari J. I'm Lex Michael. As you may have noticed, I have an issue with my throat. Um, my voice isn't a hundred percent today, so I just got to let you know that your, your speakers aren't bad. It's, it's incredible. It feels like it got so much worse the second we started. Well, it's because I had to increase the volume of my voice. Right. Whereas before I was talking very cl- l- low. Right. B- as to preserve my voice. Um, and now that you have a device designed to amplify sound, you have to additionally compensate by raising your own volume. That's true. I have to keep the energy up. Otherwise, we just sound like NPR. <laughs> you know, I could. Uh, hey, guys, this is Tari J. I just wanted to uh, make sure that you guys were uh, keeping up with the times. Uh, is that entertaining? Do you feel like that's good for you, Lex Michael? This is David B. and Cooley in for Terry Gross. Yeah. Because um, Terry Gross is never there. <laughs> but uh, if this is your first time listening, uh, you should know that this uh, isn't how I usually sound. <laughs> and also, uh, you should know that what we do here is we introduce each other to different media, whether it be movies, music, television, spoken word, experiences, things that have built us up as people. We hope that in sharing them with you, it builds you up. We are the retrospective that's introspective. See, even in Tari's infirmed condition, in his moment of greatest need, in his darkest hour, he still laid out the facts for you guys. That's commitment. That is how much Tari J. Miller cares about uh, the common man. Hell yeah. And woman, it's not a gender thing. Right. Uh, the common people. Common folks. Yes. Folks, so somebody Is folks offensive to somebody now? It's got to be offensive to like one person for some know, arbitrary grandpa. reason, right? Um, <laughs> Save it, Grandpa. I, yeah. <laughs> Kids these days are so offended by everything. <laughs> Go take your medicine, Grandpa. Take a nap. <laughs> Free speech. <laughs> um, Lex, what did you bring in for us? Oh, man. I brought... All right. All right. So, uh, let me let me... Uh, frame this. Let me contextualize my decision this week a little bit. So, as of this recording, about a month ago, uh, Warner's and Legendary released Godzilla: King of the Monsters, directed by Mike Doherty, based obviously on the pantheon of Toho monsters. Did not light the world on fire, uh, neither critically nor commercially. Uh, we both saw it. I know you you dug it a good deal, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. I was also pretty into it, uh, but a lot of folks were not. And I thought it was really interesting that when I looked at the film writers uh, whose reviews I was tracking, there seemed to be a clear divide uh, in terms of who liked the movie and who didn't. And it seemed to be based almost entirely on whether or not they had been fans, especially growing up, of the original Toho Godzilla movies. And you and I had a conversation after I saw the movie where I said... I think I can understand what certain audiences are finding off-putting about this, but this feels to me like they're really going hard in the direction of emulating very, very directly and specifically the style of some of the older Godzilla movies. It's like we're we're essentially slapping an American uh, coat of paint on an original uh, uh, Toho model. You know what I mean? Like, um, it felt very much like what I... I think what I said to you was it feels very much like they shot a a Japanese Godzilla script, translated it directly, shot that, and that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, it occurred to me that with the exception of catching, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes of one or two of them on TV, probably in black and white, when I was a young kid, I'd never seen one of the Godzilla movies with the exception of the, you know, the the Hollywood productions, the... uh, 2014 and of course the 1998 version with Matthew Broderick a beloved timeless American classic of course the real Citizen Kane yes but I had never gone back to the source and uh, wouldn't you know it uh, Criterion Channel beautiful beautiful oasis in the desert Criterion Channel which which sprang up after Filmstruck died you uh, if you've listened to the show in the past you know, I was a real big fan of Filmstruck. It was a terrible day in my home when they shut down Filmstruck. But thankfully, now we have the Criterion Channel. And the Criterion Channel has most of the first 
seven or so original Godzilla movies. Uh, I think the one of the ones they don't have, they don't have uh, Ibera Horror of the Deep, a.k.a. Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster. And that's off the top of my head, the only one I can think of that they don't. Oh, they do not have uh, King Kong versus Godzilla, okay. which was the third one. But they have the rest of of that original run, starting with the first one. And they also have uh, audio commentaries that you can listen to on the first movie. They have the American, the sort of uh, uh, bastardized American cut of the original Godzilla film, which they dubbed King of the Monsters. That's uh, the one with Steve Martin, right? What? Like... His the actor's name is Steve <laughs> Martin. Um, uh, maybe not the Steve Martin, the comedian, right? I was but like the fifties actor. I was like, man, I will get on that right now. I will get on the the not so beloved American version if somehow they were like Forrest Gump style Steve Martin into that film. I mean, they do that with that actor named steve martin they do it is fascinating reading about the production of the american version how they they heavily re-edit the movie there are there's this new character that was not in the original film an american character who essentially becomes your de facto protagonist and you end up following him and you end up losing a lot of the original movie especially anything that was uh was uh, colored a little politically and that's something that when i went back to look at the first one I I fell down this rabbit hole of pretty quickly, and that's why I wanted to bring in the original Godzilla in particular, the 1954 Ishiro Honda Godzilla, but also I really, I, I want to talk about the historical context of this film, but also how batshit crazy the films that followed are. Uh, that's what I've been doing with my nights is going through one by one on the Criterion channel and then having to you know jump over to other services uh, to to see a couple of the others. But I've been working my way through and wow, yeah, quite a thing indeed. So uh, we are yeah we're we're breaking down that sweet sweet Godzilla nineteen fifty four. Um, so. Uh, Give me a, give me a little give me a little pitch, baby. Like, what? Why? What do I care? Who cares about a giant lizard creature? All right. First of all, I, I don't care who you are. No one is above giant monsters fucking shit up. Okay. So let's let's contextualize that for everybody right now. If that's your initial response, shh, just take a seat, breathe, breathe. Your your voice counts too, but but take a breather. Hear us out. Maybe we can change your, your frame of reference here because the original Godzilla 1954 is so much more than just another monster movie. It is a movie that is very explicitly an allegory for the atomic bomb and the effect of the atomic bomb made in the one country on Earth that has suffered the, that has suffered the effects of an atomic bomb blast. And it is so, so, so steeped in the philosophies and politics of the discussions that came out of it. There is a scene in... The in the movie where uh, there's essentially a debate about whether to reveal to the public the origins of Godzilla, right? Like, uh, is Godzilla actually the product of nuclear testing? Which spoilers, yes, he is. Uh, that debate in the movie was mirroring a debate that was going on in Japan uh, at around the same time, based on the uh, it's called the Lucky Dragon incident, right? And essentially, like, okay, so you're familiar, yeah. Okay, so if you're not familiar, correct me if I'm missing anything, but essentially the Lucky Dragon, after World War II, uh, obviously the the Japanese didn't have a ton of say in what uh, the Americans were doing. Everybody who lost that war, if you recall, got big wrist slaps, Mm -hmm. just real big wrist slaps. Actually, I think it's a fair assessment that the Japanese got the biggest wrist slaps by a lot. So Americans were uh, continuing to test. They were testing hydrogen bombs now. and there was a it was a fishing vessel essentially yes that that was not caught in the blast but was the direct recipient of a ton of radiation um and if i recall correctly almost everybody survived right like they were getting their uh they were getting their radiation treatments and they got uh while they were getting their blood transfusions they most of them came down with hepatitis but most of them, most of them were fine, except if I'm not mistaken, the the radio man uh, was the only one to succumb, and he is considered the first victim of the hydrogen bomb because he's the only one to have succumbed from his radiation wounds. But there was a big debate at the time about sort of copying to the origin of 
of that and also their their place and their relationship with america and what how to navigate that and are are do they you know do we uh, is it appropriate that we allow ourselves to be kowtowed what can we do etc cetera, etc cetera. and those philosophies and points of view at odds with one another are it's very directly and explicitly reflected in this movie right but also of course the terror that godzilla uh, has rot uh, on on Japan and so many places. Everywhere that dude goes, things fall down and and break. But <laughs> uh, very direct analog for for the destruction of the bomb, right? Like if it was a uh, if it was a, be- a large beast, right? You could take it down with a missile, right? A couple of tanks probably be all right, right? But if it's literally a nuclear powered dinosaur. What do you do in the face of that, right? What do you do in the face of an atomic bomb where nothing? I mean, right? Like, I guess you could get under your desk and curl into a ball and hope that saves you. But what do you do in the face of something that unstoppably powerfully destructive? Right. Isn't that almost a direct quote from, I think it was either the writer or director where they were like. This was a conversation that they had when they were, when they were trying to develop the character. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was the pitch for that movie. Um, As, uh, if, I gotta, not... <laughs> if it's a concise pitch, I'm not. I'm not servicing my base. It's not on brand. People be like, who is this? Right. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, but I feel like now we kind of have to just put down that spoiler wall. If anyone is super duper concerned with spoilers and doesn't know what happens in the original Godzilla, this is, this is the time to jump off. Um, so we're, we're dropping it down. While you're here, while you're waiting, don't forget to subscribe to get this in your feed every Tuesday uh, so you can stay up on what's going on. Don't forget to, you know, follow us on Missing Outcast. That's M-I-S-S-I-N-G-O-U-T-C-A-S-T on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, But yeah. All right. Well, we've given you enough time. uh, So I'm going to now drop down the spoiler wall. Um, so yeah, you talked about the the boat incident, which is mirrored in the first uh, scene of the whole movie. Yes, we get a bunch of people on a fishing vessel. They see uh, what seems to be an explosion, and they disappear off the face of the earth. Which is not exactly what happened in the real case, but like could have been. Right? They were. Let's. One could assume they were a certain amount of meters from that being their fate. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of uh, the shots of Godzilla's head poking above the water. Just, oh, yeah. hang, just hanging out out there. Like, because imagine, right? For, just put yourself in the position of these sailors pre catastrophe, yeah. right? You're on a boat. You got a job to do, right? But we're, we're living in an age where, the, you know, uh, depending on the weather, you might not be able to radio back, right? You don't have signal boosters. You don't have iPhones. You got none of that, right? Your equipment is 1950 style equipment on a fishing boat. And you probably don't have a huge amount of money. So you got no one to call and you know that, right? It's like, okay, we'll do our job. We'll go back into the, into the, the shore later. We're fine. Yeah. And then you happen to look off of like the starboard bow and, and you know, the half a mile away, you just see this giant dragon head poking up like a shark fin. Right. And Matt, like, what do you do? What goes through your head in that moment? I'm like, hey, maybe we should turn around. Like, what? What do you guys think is over in that opposite direction? You know? What? what they're what like, you? why are you? Why are you talking like like that? Like, we would, like this is my first day. <laughs> Leave like, me alone. <laughs> like, would you actually? <laughs> would you actively try to keep anybody else from noticing? Like, if they if they see it, morale will drop too far, and we will never make it out of this scenario. Yes. But if we keep everybody in the dark and positive, then we're good. We'll make well, it back. It's because like sometimes like it's it's always going to be fifty fifty. Some motherfuckers is like we got to check it out. And it's like, no, that's doom. It spells nothing but doom for us. <laughs> and so the best case scenario is to be like, yo, I just heard on the radio that the fish are over there. We should do the fish that are over on the other side. And you just, you get to the front of the boat and you lead them and you just, you tell them you can't turn around. Yeah. If you turn around, it's like Orpheus and Eurydice. The right. only way we make it through this is if you keep looking forward. You've got to trust that there's no giant nuclear-powered monster back there. Yeah. Because if you if you look, there will be one and we'll die. Right. <laughs> I feel like that's strangely compelling. <laughs> My heart <laughs> is soaring. Um, and then, like, once we finish our, our trip, once we're back and safe, 
I'll, I'll make a call to the police or the the military and be like, hey, you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you, but just trust Trust me. But it's the fucking mayor from Jaws, and he's like, we are not closing the beaches on the 4th of July. <laughs> uh, yeah. We should have done Jaws this week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, hang on. Bro. What's the tie-in? Uh, tie-in is uh, there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of fireworks in the third act of this <laughs> picture, kids. There sure were some fireworks between the young lovers in their triangle in this oh, story. Yeah. Which, by the way, uh, this movie, Godzilla, Godzilla, of course, the title character, is, the, is really the star of the show. But we spent a great deal of time uh, on our human characters, as we do in these movies. But, uh, yeah, a lot of the focus of this film... Um, set against the backdrop of this nuclear allegory yeah. is about these three these three star-crossed star-crossed loves <laughs> one of whom wears a cool eye patch oh yeah well it's funny that you mention that like godzilla is the like everyone knows now in retrospect that like yes godzilla is a hundred percent the like breakout star of this feature but like i would imagine when it was being created like the the writer director i assume that they were like no everyone's going to be really intrigued by like all these human creatures and how they're affected like cuz even the way that it's filmed right. is also very much from the human perspective and like you're made to care about all these humans when well, we do set up even some of the the far more minor characters who fall victim to Godzilla later in the movie we do set up as individuals earlier on right however and um, this could be an apocryphal story. So I do want to, I, I need to cite, uh, if you go to the Criterion channel uh, or you buy the Criterion disc, you can listen to an audio commentary with film historian David Kalid, who's super, super duper knowledgeable about all this stuff. I listened to this commentary and I picked up a lot of really interesting stuff from it. So I encourage you to go check that out. Um, but he tells a story about that uh, the actor who plays Hideo Ogata, the sort of male romantic lead, his name is Akira uh, Takarada, and he had been in movies for about two years at that point, and he was, uh, according to Kalet, was on this track to becoming like the, the Japanese Cary Grant. Um, and apparently, as the story goes, he swaggers onto set uh, and basically he's introducing himself to people as the star of the movie and the, the old grizzled crew would just quietly like grumble to each other and oh, Godzilla's a star. <laughs> I mean, it's true. It's, I think it's, I mean, it makes sense. It's also funny because I, especially because spoiler alert, we're past the spoiler, like Godzilla dies at the end. Um, Godzilla almost always dies at the end and yet always comes back. Right. Um, so I, actually, no, you know what? I'm going to correct myself. Usually Godzilla is either, uh, trapped or runs away. Right. Um, but this one, he definitively dies. Yes. Like you see his, his bones and then you see those bones disappear. Yes. Um, so presumably when you get to the sequel, Godzilla raids again, uh, it's either, it might actually be like the, the second Godzilla down, like here's Godzilla two, either that, or we just have to, we just have to accept it as a retcon. Well, I mean, in, in the movie itself, it's like, if we keep nuclear testing, there might be another Godzilla somewhere. Right. And lo and behold. Yeah, so there are lots of Godzilla everywhere. And that one, they trap, at the end of Godzilla Raids again, they trap him in ice. But the way it's shot, and because Godzilla is essentially a puppet at that point, it looks like they're just covering up with ice cubes. <laughs> it's awesome. It's great. Um, but yeah, like, and it's it's funny because even the the main theme for the movie was originally supposed to be the theme for the Japanese self-defense force. Uh, it's their military, and it's like that do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. Uh, and ultimately, like, after this movie, they're like, nah, bruh, that's Godzilla's theme. Fuck you. Because, <laughs> um, like, they play it, and it's this tri It's not, not triumphant because they fail horribly, but, like, as they're parading out the military trying to stage their defense and they're like, yeah, listen to our sweet, sweet anthem. And then moving forward, everyone's like, it was never for you, bro. You never stood a chance. It's ain't, your th it's ain't your theme song. It's like if you were a wrestler and you came out and you got like the, the fireworks and the music um, and you're like, yeah, yeah. Oh man, it's great. And then you like turn around and there's an even bigger wrestler that everyone's actually cheering for. And you're like, oh, 
okay, I know my place now. I, I love the image of a lot of uh, uh, members of the Imperial Army too frightened to argue because they're afraid Godzilla will get them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, and so I guess now we can talk about the love triangle because you brought it up. I don't, and the thing is, I don't know that there's really a ton to talk about in terms of the love triangle. With the with for me, the the big exception there, of course, being the character of. Sarazawa, who uh, 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 Ken Watanabe's character in the more recent Hollywood productions, obviously his name yeah. is a direct nod to this character. Uh, obviously, what what the, they call it, the the oxygen destroyer, yes, uh, which features in the more recent Godzilla King of the Monsters, originates in the original picture. Mm-hmm. Um, also, Sweet Eye Patch, yes, he's like Sarazawa is like the Nick Fury of this movie. It's funny because it it's also a little bit of a bummer because it it they kind of imply that. The only reason why he's not marrying the main, uh, the main lead, is because he is scarred. So like he got a scar and lost an eye, and so now he's like, I guess I'm unworthy. Yeah. She's like, Oh, that's cool. I will go die now. <laughs> guess I'll just dive into my work. It's I'm like, not never gonna get any love. And it's like, but wait, Sarazawa, no, I I feel for you as well. Nope, don't worry about me. Just going down here to die, Sarazawa. <laughs> wait, nope, nope, I got it. I understand. He's under the water. Now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean that character is like with current standards, you expect him to be the villain of the feature, right? Um, and there is technically there's no real villain because you in could the argue movie. you could argue Godzilla's a victim just as much as anybody else is. Right, he's just a taller victim. Right, Godzilla was just napping, and then we were like, "Yo, you want some radiation? Because you gonna get it." And he, and now Godzilla's like, "Hey, don't do that. I hate you. I'm angry." <laughs> it's almost like it's almost like we injected him with steroids because like in the movie they're like he was just a regular giant lizard and then the the bomb hit and he absorbed all the radiation which made him like a radiation lizard so it's like we injected him with steroids and and we're like why is he so angry why is he so mad at us? And he's like, I don't know what to do with all this energy. <laughs> and he's just like slamming things around. He's mad, bro. Do you know he's what got I... testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I, I actually it didn't? It didn't really occur to me. Uh, there's a lot of time spent d- debating and discussing uh, the origins of Godzilla in relation to nuclear power, right? But I don't recall a point in which we take a break to go, hold on, dinosaurs still exist. Yeah, like well, there's here's a nuclear dinosaur. Obviously, that is the far more pressing issue. But at a certain point, we really ought to circle back to the fact that dinosaurs still exist on the Earth. <laughs> well, I mean, there is the the scene with all the uh, the islanders where the old man is like, "Oh, it's Godzilla!" Like, so you have to imagine that he's that either Godzilla himself or like creatures like Godzilla are just part of the folklore. So it'd be like if. Uh, Candyman showed up and you're like, oh, it's Candyman. What's up? Or if the Loch Ness Monster was like, yo, I'm real. I've, I've been real this whole time. And you're like, well, that's cool. And you got you got uh, crazy radiation powers. And it's like, yeah, that's why I can talk. Right. Yeah. No, but, but, but like that, that does track up to a point right there. And in later movies, we see that uh, uh, I believe it's on Infant Island. There is a whole Mothra cult so obviously there are in in godzilla canon we do establish concretely that there are uh groupings of people who are aware of the existence of these giant creatures and who have managed to in the case of mothra cohabitate with them up to a point mothra's usually asleep but managed to cohabitate up to a point but it doesn't I, i don't see the big city folk living you know what i mean like look what happens when godzilla shows up i don't see them living comfortably alongside these creatures and they seem very surprised to see something that large walking around that's true so i I really i wonder at what point some of the the community elders get together and go so we really need to talk about how like that guy literally just said there could be more dinosaurs so maybe (laughs) we should talk about the dinosaur thing um 
yeah they don't address that in two through seven there's no there's no like group of elders that are like all right so uh a few years ago a monster popped out the sea maybe we should like discuss that and and the implications it feels like past a point once we've established that godzilla exists or rather uh that a second godzilla exists it seems like the world increasingly takes for granted the existence of these giant monsters. Right. Um, and also, of course, the character of Godzilla goes through a good uh, uh, many permutations between the first film and even, I mean, the, the last one I watched was Son of Godzilla, where Godzilla is essentially a sitcom dad. Um, is that the one with Godzuki? Is that Baby Godzilla's name? Yeah. I guess, yeah. I just yeah. call him Baby Godzilla um, or Godzilla Jr. Well, you should, if you like uh, Godzuki, you should watch the animated series. Um, oh, the one that they made after the, like the American animated series? No, 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 or no, the... no, no. The, they made, um, they made it, I want to say it was in like the 70s. It used to show on Hanna-Barbera Network. Um, and essentially... Was that, there was a cartoon just about him? Yes. So it was Godzilla and Godzuki. Um, and so this, this group of teenagers or this family, um, they would... The, the formula was they would run into a monster and then they press a button and then Godzilla would show up, fight the monster, and then be like, oh, Godzilla, thanks again. And then Godzuki would be hanging out with him always. And so uh, sometimes like Godzuki was the reason why Godzilla would be fighting. Other other times it was just like Godzilla, Godzuki's hanging out with the family, being a cute little sidekick. That's uh, That's the tone of most of Son of Godzilla. Yeah, it's okay. So there are these giant praying mantis monsters that at one point start to fuck with him. They're like beating him up and he's on the ground and he's super sad and he's like crying. It's genuinely upsetting to watch. But Godzilla shows up and beats him up and scolds his kid. There's a lot of kids scolding in that one. Right. But he really he feels like a sitcom dad. The score feels very sitcom. -y. Some of the establishing island shots look like establishing sitcom island shots. Point being, there is a, a range <laughs> uh, in terms of how Godzilla is depicted in these films. Right. And in the deleted scenes of that film is when they have the really hard-pressed, serious conversation about the existence of dinosaurs in their their world. Right. But most of it happens off screen. Right. Of course. Like a couple of characters walk back in after a big monster fight. And they're like, I'm sure I'm glad we had that, that discourse on the existence of dinosaurs. Right. Um, that's something I, I really liked about Godzilla King of the Monsters, uh, the the new 2019, 2019 yeah um is it really it really uh builds a world that is steeped in monsters and and ha and i feel like accurate accurately depicts how we would react to knowing that all these different goliaths exist or mm -hmm. titans i think is what they call them in the movies um that's something i i really admired about that movie yeah um but back to this movie um uh, something I really enjoyed because I I grew up watching like bits and pieces of Godzilla stuff. And I think I had mostly seen Godzilla as like the silly uh, w once he became, uh, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street three Freddy Krueger, uh, <laughs> that the, kind of thing. By the time we get to by the time we get to Son of Godzilla, he feels more like Freddy's dad, Freddy Krueger. Mm hmm. Like yes. you might as well be Bugs Bunny, <laughs> but yeah. And so I feel like that was the majority of my Godzilla experience that and the animated series, which is great. Um, but I had, I guess I had forgotten how great the miniature compositing was mm -hmm. like just all the really interesting shots of like the, the lower angle on Godzilla and you see the people running um, and you see him destroying like assorted tall things around them. Yeah. Um, and then just like that intercut with people uh, having debris falling around them and, and all of the, the outcry, um, that stuff I felt like was super well done. And it's, it's funny cause it, it, it was not like a last minute thought, but it ended up being the standard because the original way they wanted to make the movie was going to take too long. Yes. So just for a little bit of historical context, Eiji Tsuburaya was the effect supervisor on this movie. And mm -hmm. uh, obviously prior to Godzilla, monster movies, the way we think of monster movies now, weren't really a thing, but they, there was some precedent. Obviously, the original King Kong was one. And when it was re-released in the 50s, it was so much more successful than it had been on its initial release, of course, 
brilliant, brilliant, brilliant stop motion effects to bring those giant creatures to life in that movie. Also, around that time, Ray Harryhausen was was in full swing doing his stuff. And there was, uh, I think, the year before Godzilla, it was like The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms came out. Um, so they're looking at those techniques, right? Like they were looking specifically at stop motion techniques to try and bring Godzilla to life. And Subaraya did, I guess, did the math, did the calculus on this somehow and determined that to do it that way would take seven years. Right. And that's why they said, you know what? Puppets and suits. <laughs> I mean, it has the same kind of tactile feeling that you get when, take for example, when people compare the original Jurassic Park to more recent Jurassic Parks, with which are more CGI heavy. Mm -hmm. Whereas the original Jurassic Park, I mean, basically due to the limitations of CGI back then and it taking like days to render a single scene, um, it they relied very much on practical effects. And so like people were able to actually touch the things that they were interacting with. And so it also has that feeling about it. Like the, the stop motion of let's say King Kong is interesting mm -hmm. and it has a, a, a very specific aesthetic, but I don't feel like it has a, as much like weight to it. Whereas I think that seeing this creature actually destroying and stepping on things and um, seeing, being able to composite the people running away um, from this creature that is actually there, air quotes. Right. Um, I think actually allows you to suspend your disbelief, whereas I think if it was stop motion, it'd be a little bit more cartoony. Yes. Um, yes, I think there's an argument to be made there. And, and like you were saying earlier, right, you were talking about the compositing of elements within a shot, right? So like in one shot, you will have your extras at the bottom of the frame, and in the same shot, all composited together, you will have your miniatures, you will have your person in a suit, and you will have some effect stuff going on. Up, like you'll have like a matte painting right. basically going on. And all of this is happening in the same frame. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to overstate how impressive that is when you're doing all of it. For all intents and purposes, you're doing it in camera. Right. Because um, this was back in the 50s where this is before a lot of the techniques that we are we kind of take for granted this, every this, day right this was before they invented technology <laughs> yeah everything that was happening was actually black and white back then too <laughs> it's crazy um but like even the the like atomic breath effect was really cool how uh there's a, a shot in which godzilla is melting the electric towers and so what they had done was they essentially made them out of wax um, and then they blew super hot air on them and then had hot uh, studio lights on it, which gave it a like a white hot heat effect, uh, which is clever. Like, I, I can't imagine I'm not ingenuitous, uh, if that's a word. So, like, I can't imagine uh, wrapping my brain around solving that issue. Right. Yeah. But some guy was like. Yeah, why don't we just make it out of wax and then like do do some sweet sweet uh, heat work and then it's like yeah this achieves the perfect effect in camera that you want it to. Yeah, um, uh, Subaraya was uh, pretty pretty dang. What was the word you just used? Ingenuitous. Yeah, it was pretty dang ingenuitous when it came to creating special effects. Like he developed these techniques himself, and I, I recall hearing about how he got he got a hold of his own print of King Kong and just studied the print religiously and and somehow was able to I guess reverse engineer their techniques and figure out how to do it himself as and and in a world without technology <laughs> they were still they were still uh, carving each individual frame into rocks yep and, and like rotoscoping the no zoetroping there we go make it a zoetrope of all of the rocks and yeah. somebody had to stand there next to them and and be like it's it's Godzilla Rawr! and like do all of it themselves. Yes, each time. And then there was like a guy playing a piano. Um, <laughs> it was a great show. You had to see it in person. <laughs> um, or, no. <laughs> uh, kind of going back to Serizawa. Yes. Um, I really liked that they managed to not so subtly. Uh, have a discussion about the nuclear arms race mm -hmm. using this character where he's like, I developed a new thing that will essentially wipe out all life in, in its proximity. 
Um, and if anyone is able to get this thing, then it means that they're going to use it to kill people. Yep. And I can't allow, because even if they know it exists, that means that someone will try to develop it themselves. And ultimately like, it's just going to be a, a, a blood bloodbath mm -hmm. of people trying to have the newest, biggest, coolest weapon, um, which, you know, has historical precedence and is also almost at this point where not since there's been no additional additionally destructive development since the nuclear bomb like that was the pinnacle of like oh man you want to kill a bunch of motherfuckers like this is how you do it um we're not we've like tempered back on it and that like now everyone's like look i have a nuclear bomb and you have a nuclear bomb so like if we are to attack each other we are going to mutually destroy each other so let's it's, like it nah. is assured right that we will mutually destroy each other so you know let's refrain from having arms races um we we're, we're doing we're doing our best i mean we're trying um the, to, to be to be fair no precedent for anything going wrong in that arena so uh, how could we have learned our lesson totally that you know that's that's how it works <laughs> Um, but I, I like that we're able to to have that and, and also to see that this the character was so res resolute in it that he was willing to sacrifice his own life so that it never fell into anyone else's hands. It's like the, right before he died, he looked at the camera and was like, fuck you, Oppenheimer, and then just disintegrated. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's pretty decisive action. <laughs> it's pretty decisive action in a movie that doesn't feature a huge amount of decisive action on the part of the human characters. You got a lot of politician type figures hemming and hawing over what to do. Right. So you got that one dude who's like, look, I got a hat, got a sweet eye patch. I got one eye, but I keep it on the ball. Ha. That's it. That's it. Those were his last <laughs> words. Those were his, what he said. He's like, I'm going to go die now. Yeah. I'm going to keep this out of your hands. Win the day. And then it's like he's he's sinking. And it's like, but but how will you reap the rewards if you blow yourself up? And he's like, oh, shit. But he's underwater. <laughs> he's like, rewards. Shm rewards. I have an eye patch. No one will love me. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, because that one girl said that? Yes. <laughs> um, he's He's got convictions. Like, he seems very sure of himself. I'm just going to let him go. Yeah. Uh, I just feel bad that the the one girl's dad, uh, he, he didn't get to study Godzilla. He didn't get to cut him up and splash around on his insides. You know? I felt bad. I'm sure if he's committed enough to the concept, he will find something to cut open and play around the insides of. <laughs> um, no, but it has to be a Godzilla. It has know? to be a Godzilla. Yeah. So, like, I assume that in, in all of the subsequent ones, he, like, shows up and he's like, is this one dead yet? Hey, can I splash around on the insides? Oh, yeah. And they're like, he's our friend now. Stop it. At a certain he's point, friend. He just breaks and he does the, the Tommy Lee Jones thing from the end of Men in Black where he's just like, eat me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, uh, I wonder, because that character, like he was a zoologist. And so you, you understand why he's like, we must preserve life. Like this is a, a discovery that has never been seen before. Did you see that trilobite I pulled out of the ocean? They're supposed to be extinct. He has trilobites in his feet. Um, <laughs> he does. That's 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 the one of Godzilla's primary characteristics. <laughs> is trilobites in his feet. Uh, you know, it's like you're like, all right, what do you know about Godzilla? He's a lizard. Um, he uh, is sometimes bipedal is aquatic, has atomic breath, and has trilobites on his feet. <clears throat> That's it. <laughs> That's what you know across all the different uh, the different franchise. 35 movies. 36 now, I think. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, and that's the primary thing you need to know. <laughs> okay. I'll take it. I'm going to make a short list of things. I'll get it tattooed on my arm. Right. And I will not. It'll be like memento. It'll be like, what do I got to remember <laughs> yeah. about Godzilla and shit? <laughs> um, but you said it's about, there are, including the American 
productions, the Hollywood productions. There are currently 35 Godzilla films, I believe, 35 official Godzilla films. Right. Uh, not including, and not including like Mothra originated in in her own movie. Right. So not including those, like Godzilla headlining, um, for all intents and purposes, headlining films. It's uh, yeah, 35, and then with next year's release of. King Kong versus Godzilla or whatever the title is. Godzilla versus Kong, whatever they're calling it. Right. That'll bring us to 36. There's a lot of these. They've been doing this for a while. Isn't it? If I'm not mistaken, it's the longest running film franchise. Yes. I believe it holds the Guinness record for that. Right. Like like the Bond franchise is, is pretty pretty uh, storied and has a long history, but they started in, what, 62, I believe. Yeah. Godzilla, what, eight years? I can do math. Eight years before that. Yeah, totally. That's that sounds correct. like math. That's totally right. Yeah. Love math. You've mathed real good. I don't like math. You're the best math in the history of Matthew. They should call you Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. 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 This is, this is good content. <laughs> this is what people come for. It is. They're like, wow. Was that a, did you think of that just off the top of his head? Oh my gosh. Oh, uh, dear. <laughs> no. Uh, I felt bad for the little girl who was crying for her mom. And it makes me wonder if they like had to pinch the girl to make her cry. And the, or if they were like, Hey, your mom actually died. And she's like, no, <laughs> I do. You always wonder, right? How do you wring a performance like that out of a child actor? But some, honestly, there are some, there are some kids that are really naturally gifted that if you say, okay, you're sad, cry now, they can just switch it on. That's true. Um, also, it helps that little girl grow up to be Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, mm-hmm. super method. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the end of that take, uh, she smoked a cigarette and was like, oh, man, one day I'm going to play Lincoln. <laughs> and somebody, it's like some some crew member of the director comes up to him. It's like, all right, uh, Daniel, that was great. And he goes, don't call me Daniel. I'm a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> And then the other actor comes by and is like, you know, I'm the star of this film. <laughs> it's like, you're not. You're not the star of this film. It's like, Steve Martin is. <laughs> uh, Daniel Day-Lewis is Godzilla. That'd be great. I'd watch Look it. Look him transform. <laughs> if I say I am king of the monsters, you will agree. Is that a reference? Oh, you've not seen There Will Be Blood? No, no, I have it's it. The one where he drinks a milkshake. I've I've heard that quote from it. <laughs> I've heard people go, "I drink your milkshake," and right. then they that point one. their finger downwards. I assume because he's putting his finger in the milkshake. Uh, there isn't spoilers. There's not actually a milkshake. What? It's a is... metaphorical milkshake. Why? Cause, okay. Because he's trying to take, he's he's trying to he's trying to he's trying to take from somebody. I ain't gonna spoil. It's an it's an American modern classic. You should watch it. I'll make you watch it. Okay. Paul Dano's in it. Love Paul Dano. Cool. I don't know who that is. Yeah, you do. You you'd be like, oh, it's that that. Guy. Of course, Paul Dano. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. totally. To 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 totally. To to co to totally. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you also wanted to talk about where this franchise goes um yes and i know that essentially godzilla is for the most part they're like all right we did our our we did our cool artsy film now it's time to rake in that cash baby we're gonna put godzilla in everything and at a certain point they like do all these crazy genre films with Godzilla. There's like a Godzilla Western. There's a Godzilla sci-fi. There's I've a Godzilla not made fantasy. It to, I've There's not made God- it to a Godzilla <laughs> Western, although that sounds dope. <laughs> Paul Paul Thomas Anderson does his own does Godzilla, and he's like, "All right, who is going to be soaked in yellows?" And then uh, who? Uh, and then uh, David Lynch does his. David Cronenberg does his. Everyone does their own Godzilla. I'm I'm upset because it's not real, you know. Like I won't actually get to see that. Right. Um, I mean, if Cronenberg did make a Godzilla, he'd be less of a like a lizard, and he'd be just like a bunch of boils that are in a vague lizard shape. It's like definitely like uh, speckled with little bits of machinery, right? Of, of ambiguous origin and purpose. Yeah. Like like. Uh, kind of like in 
I'm sure that you've seen at least gifs of the transformation sequence in Akira where the guy, yes. yeah, yeah, kind of like that where it, it starts as like a, a little lizard, a bomb goes off and then it just like all the bits of the bomb like start Co- coagulating together and then takes a, a, like the form of a lizard and you're like this is a, this is a nightmare yeah, I'm not I don't I can't explain why but I am so upset <laughs> the person next to you is like I can't explain why but I have such a heart on and you're like what <laughs> I have never been this upset or this aroused, <laughs> let alone simultaneously. <laughs> I'm going to have a lot to talk to the therapist about this week. I uh, bet she's going to tell me it has to do with my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awkward because my therapist is my mom. <laughs> and also a giant lizard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Speckled with bits of machinery. <laughs> Uh, but like, I like that at a certain point, they take this thing that was, it almost, it almost has a nice poetry about it and that they take this thing that has, um, represented so much harm to them yes, and turns it into something that is more, um, like, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? It's more encouraging or empowering uh yes they learn to stop worrying and love the bomb i don't know what that means no this it's dr strange love i've never seen this whole (laughs) show is built on that i have not seen anything oh man you can't assume that i know anything it's a very funny super blackly comedic uh satire about nuclear war essentially oh how black it's hella black pretty black oh uh, hell Don't yeah get peter sellers was pretty black oh he's shit not black at all <laughs> but he does play three characters okay cool he's, he's white or he was white he's dead so he's not anything but i'm gonna move on <laughs> he was white now he's bones <laughs> oh no <laughs> those are your words not mine oh no, i didn't take you, it that that's far. what you said i <laughs> took i took you to the porch and you're the one who stepped through the door <laughs> I always will step through the door. <laughs> if there's a threshold, I'm going to cross it. That's gross. I'm, that sounds I'm, somehow... Uh, it's just no. Something's... I'm a protagonist. I'm the protagonist of my own life. And so if there's a threshold, I'm always... I'm going to cross the threshold. <laughs> You're the Sarah Zawa of the story. <laughs> it's like, wait, Tari, no. We, we, You can come back. You don't need to do that. You're like, nope, don't worry about me. I will be over here with this device. <laughs> I was in my mind. I was like, but that means I end up dead. But everyone's story ends up with them dead. So it's like, it's no different. Right. And to be fair, Sarah Zara's story, like, like all of her stories ends with him being dead, but he gets to be dead. Awesome. Yeah. Mm. He gets, he gets to be, uh, he like, he gets to die based on his convictions. Whereas like most of us just die shitting ourselves. <laughs> I mean, you don't know. He's under those waves. He probably shot himself as he was dying. I would dying. imagine that he or, was disintegrating. Right, if it so destroys like, all, and he's literally holding the thing. So yeah, you know what? He yeah. probably doesn't have that. But he doesn't have the indignity of of voiding one's body. Nope. As he leaves, he just gets to like become like incongruent matter. He's just <laughs> like, yeah. See you guys never. Fuck <laughs> off. No one will love me. <laughs> <laughs> So that's how it works. All right. Fair. <laughs> like I said, I just I brought you to the porch. Yeah. <laughs> you, you took the oxygen destroyer inside, sat down. <laughs> Everybody on the street was like, you don't need to do this. And you were like, I got my hat. <laughs> I got an iPad. I don't need it, but I'm wearing it. Um, and there he goes. Yep. Good, good, good for him. Good stuck stuck to his stuck to his metal. <laughs> we we should all be so strong of character. Uh, <laughs> Fun shitting yourselves on your deathbed. <laughs> and, then, and then as he's like as he's sinking with it, he sees a truck drive up, and it's it's the guys jump out. Like they take up the gate on the back. Oxygen destroyers for everyone. And he's like, no, <laughs> dead. <laughs> Oh. But this is great because they're all like, "I want one. I want. I don't want to shit myself when I die. Give me an oxygen <laughs> destroyer."
<laughs> yep. <laughs> I mean, I it is kind of a bummer because. The Oxygen Destroyer does come back in a different movie as well. So he just died for nothing. Uh, but, but, they, but they can start marketing it as a device that enables you to die with dignity. So he didn't. He didn't. He died. Sarazawa died for something after all. And it's, it's to spare us all the shame. Ah, <laughs> oh, jeez. Um. <laughs> oh man, but uh, no. For for real though, I want to talk about two things, two two uh, significant points of interest for me um, as relates to this movie in particular, but also the franchise as a whole. And I do want to talk about how bonkers these movies get, and I'll I'll, I'll come back around to that. But first. Briefly, I wanted to just hit the the relationship between writer-director Ishiro Honda and Akira Kurosawa, uh, who is obviously a legendary filmmaker, one of the most revered filmmakers uh, in the history of the medium. If you're thinking, master the art, hot, the pinnacle of artistry, yeah. and, and capital A, art, mind you, uh, uh, appreciated equally by the pretentious and unpretentious alike, Akira Kurosawa's name is way up there. Right. You wouldn't necessarily expect the overlap between that and uh, uh, genre that most people consider uh, very frivolous and silly. You would not expect the overlap to be as extensive as it is. But the two of them, Ishiro Honda and Akira Kurosawa, they were neighbors. Uh, they were close friends and collaborators for many, 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 many years. Um, I believe after um, Ishiro Honda was, was drafted into the Imperial Army, I think that happened three times. But at one point he comes back, he discovers Kurosawa is now directing. And Kurosawa uh, appointed him uh, assistant director on Stray Dog in 1949. Stray Dog is a movie that like uh, great many um, great many Kurosawa films features Takashi Shimura who's a phenomenal phenomenal actor was in uh, Seven Samurai Rashomon Ikiru which is one of the, the greatest films that there is um, but he's also in this movie he's in the original Godzilla as Dr. Yamane and he is one of a few actors that cross over back and forth between both worlds mm -hmm. um, but the two of them uh, close friends, close collaborators. Something. Uh, speaking of Takashi Shimura, something that I thought was really funny that I picked up from that audio commentary. Um, Ikiru, when Ikiru came out, the New York Times, uh, in their review, referred to Takashi Shimura as the best actor in the world. And when they were reviewing Godzilla, they asserted that nobody in the cast could act at all. <laughs> Which I find fun. Yeah. But uh, so the two of them were close collaborators for a very, very, very long time. Um, I know Ishiro Honda co-wrote uh, Kurosawa's last five movies. Um, they had a they had a bit of a back and forth uh, for a while uh, in terms of who made the most expensive movie in in Japan. Uh, for a while, it was Seven Samurai. Then it was Godzilla, and then later uh, Kurosawa took it back when they made Kagemusha, which was um, Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas convinced 20th Century Fox to put up some of the money, and Toho ended up putting uh, up a lot of uh, the rest of the money to get that movie made. Mm -hmm. um, also, so there's so there's their friendship, but then the producer of Godzilla, Tomoyushi Tanaka, uh, produced a lot of uh, monster sci-fi movies in Japan, but also produced, uh, for Kurosawa, produced The Bad Sleep Well, Yojimbo, Sanjuro, uh, Redbeard, and also Kagamusha. Huge amount of overlap between those two worlds. Um, and I find that very interesting. Yeah. Because that's... that's uh, From, an, from a, a, an outsider's perspective, or if you haven't... Uh, if you never had an opportunity to dive too deeply into either the Godzilla pantheon or the works of Kurosawa, it's it's uh, something that I, you could see somebody considering high art versus quote unquote low art, not labels I would necessarily agree with, but you could see people thinking of it that way. So the fact that the overlap uh, in terms of personnel is so extensive, I find very interesting. Right. Um, I, I think I had also read that uh, Godzilla, the original, and Seven Samurai were shooting at the same time and almost bankrupted Toho. Um, you could, I mean, that symbiotic relationship, you could imagine, like, the the Godzilla franchise has probably brought in a crazy amount of money into the Toho uh, studio. They which keep probably, making these things, so I know. clearly they're making a few bucks. But it probably also allowed them to fund these, like, uh, like the Kurosawa films, which everyone also considers art. Like you can't have one without the other. Right. 
and, uh, and I, but I love that there, there was, yeah, I love that there was so much overlap and that I think that's proof positive that the, the, the people making, if you want to reduce Godzilla to a quote unquote silly monster movie, which go watch it, then we'll talk. But even if you wanted to reduce it to that, I think it's proof positive that at the very least, the folks making these things are not total hacks. Right. And Ishiro Honda directed most of the first, I mean, the, the original Toho run directed most of them. He directed, here we go, ready? Directed the original, did King Kong versus Godzilla, Mothra versus Godzilla, Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, Invasion of Astro Monster, a.k.a. Godzilla versus Monster Zero, I believe. Uh, then also did Destroy All Monsters and All Monsters Attack and Terror of Mecha Godzilla. So this dude did a bunch of them. And this dude and, and Kurosawa, they're... You know, there you can't see it, but my fingers yeah, are just Yeah, he's making best friend yeah, hand gestures. best friend hand gestures. Yeah. So it's like when you put the one into the zero, best friends. What? <laughs> <laughs> Is that... Okay. Best friends. It would not have occurred to me to... Nope. Nope. That's, that's actually horrifying. <laughs> what? Guys, try it at home. <laughs> <laughs> you and a friend can now. Um, all right. I, but I, re I do want to talk as briefly as I can about some of the other movies that I've watched. Because I've watched up through Son of Godzilla, which is actually the, the eighth film in the series. Again, most of these are on the Criterion channel. Uh, Godzilla Raids, again, I, I don't have quite as much to say beyond what I said earlier, which is they bury him in ice cubes. And that is an image I will not soon forget. King Kong versus Godzilla. You've got, obviously, a uh, pseudimation version of Godzilla. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, obviously you have suit emation Godzilla, but you also have suit King Kong, which is uh, actually ha haunting. Um, mm -hmm. There's berry juice that gets like uh, uh, King Kong shows up in the movie almost right away, drinks this berry juice, like gets drunk and passes out. And eventually in the movie, they are able to convince him to drink it, pass out. And then they airlift him with balloons to go fight Godzilla. And if I recall correctly, at the end of this movie, they topple off of a cliff together and into some water and only King Kong emerges. It's like the end of Freddy versus Jason, except his head, uh, Godzilla's head's not cut off. Okay. Um, you get to Mothra versus Godzilla, and this is where things become truly, truly bonkers. And and this was the movie that made me decide concretely, I'm just going to plow through all of these. Uh, Mothra, as I mentioned earlier, uh, lives on Infant Island, where there's a giant Mothra cult. Mothra's usually asleep, but there are also uh, two tiny, like teeny tiny fairies, just like a, some Japanese twins that they composite into different shots um, that are basically Mothra's buddies. Um, and there's also a, a princess who is possessed by a being from Venus or that says she's from Venus can turn into light to escape an airplane and stuff. Uh -huh. Bonkers. At the end, if I, if I'm not very much mistaken, uh, Mothra dies, but there are two baby Mothras. And by the time you get to the next one, uh, which is Ghidorah, the three-headed monster, uh, I think only one of the two Mothras is still alive. So you have one sort of adolescent Mothra baby that's mucking up the business. And then, of course, that's when Ghidorah comes from space. And now we're introducing space shit into this franchise. Right. And so they all got to muck about. They got to fight. Uh, Rodan's around being like, what up? Uh, then you get to... You get to uh, uh, actually, before you even get to Invasion of Astro Monster, uh, eventually Rodan and Godzilla have to team up to stop Ghidorah because one giant monster is not enough. And uh, little baby Mothra has to persuade Godzilla and Rodan to work together. And baby Mothra does so by spraying them in the face with silly string. Oh. Gets him to pay attention. Is like, y'all, we all, we all got to team up, fight the dragon. Do they speak words or? Nah. Okay. I mean, they're like, Aah! <laughs> you know, so I like they, they're they communicating. Right. You know, but like, I, I don't speak that. I don't speak Godzilla. Um, you should, maybe you should take a class. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's an elective. I'll yeah. Go, to, go back to school. Just, just take uh, Godzilla as a second language. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so. After that, we get to the my my favorite of the movies that I've watched so far, Invasion of the Astro Monster, or of Astro Monster from 1965, in which aliens from outer space show up because uh, King Ghidorah is mucking stuff up on their planet, and they say, "Hey, Earth, you mind if we borrow Godzilla?" And and the people of Earth are basically like, "I get, I I get go ahead, that's fine." <laughs> I guess if that's what you want to do. And so they take Godzilla. There's this wonderful image in the, a couple of images in the movie of uh, they abduct Godzilla in a little bubble 
Mm-hmm. And so they've got UFOs and they have this little bubble that seems to be attached to the ship by uh, lightning. Yeah. And they put Godzilla in a little bubble. They put uh, Rodan in a little bubble and they take him up to space. And so they have to fight King Ghidorah in space, which is quite a thing to behold. Uh, there's uh, the, the next one, a Bureau Horror of the Deep. He fights a sea monster. It's a giant lobster monster. That he's got to mess up. Okay. Yep. And he like rips off his limbs and starts like mucking up a bureau with his own shit. Wild. And then of course, like I said, you get to Son of Godzilla where he's essentially a sitcom dad. He's no longer the a threatening figure. He is uh, sort of a silly, bumbling, like grumpy, like Tim Allen on Home Improvement, but with more destroying and less building stuff. Right. But I also like by that time, we are far enough in the franchise, the tone has shifted so, so far from what it was in the first place that Godzilla is like, he's not just, for all intents and purposes, your protagonist. There are still human characters, but he's he's dad. You know what I mean? Like he's the dad character. He's, he's the guy's like, I'm looking out for my boy as he scolds him, drags him away by the tail and shit. Yeah. But Godzilla at this point is no longer our enemy even though like when he steps on stuff it 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 breaks like okay so at the end of a bureau horror of the deep because now we're in that we're also in the run of these movies where godzilla doesn't die at the end he, he gets away does something fucks off somewhere but at the end of i believe it's a bureau horror of the deep the island where they're fighting is they're, they're developing some type of nuclear material and the whole island's about to explode and the human characters are getting away and they look down and they have this exchange where it's like you know Godzilla was actually pretty good to us after all. And then they start calling Godzilla. They're like, Godzilla, run! The island's going to blow up! Run, Godzilla! And Godzilla kind of jumps off a cliff into the sea. And <laughs> I swear to God. And escapes the explosion of the island. Aww. These movies are wild, dude. Yes. Yeah. Just wait till you start getting into the, like all the mecha shit that they start doing after a while. Which I know they start to do at the tail end of the Toho run. But then they they kind of take a break and they shift. And I know in the eighties they I think they soft reboot the whole thing or maybe total reboot the whole thing. And I think that's so, yeah. their, that's its own continuity. Although so far continuity is barely a thing right. in these movies. Like you could you could jump into any one of them and not miss anything that's crucial. Yeah, um, yeah. I I like that it goes into waves. In that like there's you can feel the moment when they start to kind of wonder what they're going to do with them. And then they're like, all right, it's a new era time to start doing some robot shit. Right. And then it's all robot stuff. You get like Mecha Ghidorah, you get, um, Mecha Godzilla, you get, um, space Godzilla. (laughs) You get space Godzilla. Like imagine if you will, a reality in which I just described to you an entire movie about Godzilla having to go to space and fight space monsters. And that's not even Godzilla versus space Godzilla. Yeah. Um, it's great. I really, uh, yeah, I, I, I feel like I came in during the like Mecca phase. Cause that was like the eighties into the nineties. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause that's when I was born. Yes. Yeah. The eighties into the nineties. You were born in multiple years at once. Oh, of course. I'm like, Dr. Professor Manhattan. (laughs) Yes, Dr. (laughs) Professor Manhattan. Yes, you exist outside of time. Indeed. Um, Do you have any last thoughts before we wrap up? I... I'm watching all of these now. I have committed myself to watching the entirety of the Godzilla Pantheon. I had never really seen one that wasn't one of the big Hollywood versions. um, Yeah. Of which there are three. There are... There are... Of course, I've been aware... There are so many people who are uh, who maybe grew up with these, who have gone through the entire series, know it backwards and forwards. It's it's their thing or one of their things. So uh, if one of you is listening, one or more of you, I apologize because I'm sure I sound like a fool talking about this stuff. Because if it's your thing, I would imagine you got a pretty encyclopedic level of knowledge about it. I'm new. I don't profess to be an expert. I just I I get it. Is my point. It's. I mean, obviously, it's it's the longest running film franchise in history. It's one of the most iconic film franchises in history. And I try and see as many of the big things as I can. Mm-hmm. I it, it didn't take me. I didn't even have to get halfway through these things before going. I totally get why people dig this. And are all of the movies, if you want to use an arbitrary, meaningless qualifier like, quote unquote, good, <laughs> it, as we uh, uh, frequently apply the term or not to movies, eh. But, okay. but they make up for it 
by just purely being bonkers. Yeah. Absolutely nutty as shit. Uh, but going back, the original movie is, is yeah, it's bonkers, but it is so much more than that. Uh, it has, it's, it's so much more than quote unquote, just a monster movie. If you're looking for all of the big, crazy, goofy, fun, monster smashy stuff, it's got that. It's yeah. got incredible effects work, uh, that the whole team and the way, like we were talking about the way they're able to throw in so many elements into one frame while doing it effectively all in camera, insane. And also, I mean, try to wrap your head around the historical context of who was making this movie when and why there is so much more there than just stompy stomp smashy smash it it uh it's it's i mean it's a true classic right like yeah. it's it and it is so much more than its reputation might suggest so i highly recommend it and i highly recommend checking it out if you can on the criterion channel because there's a whole bunch of other cool ancillary stuff and you can check out most of the first eight to ten of these yeah um yeah you can also find it on amazon as well um i think they have a good collection of godzilla things as well i don't know if they have like commentaries and things of that sort. right is it so are they on prime uh yeah they're oh, on prime cool yeah yeah i didn't look i was like criterion's got me i'm gonna look i mean else. yes if you if you're if you got criterion although do they have do you know if they have some of the later ones I'm not sure. I, right. I only I only really looked for this, and I scrolled through and saw that there were a bunch of available. Okay, because yeah. I'm gonna have to figure out how to source some of the later ones without hopefully without having to pay three to five bucks a pop to watch them. Right. We're gonna figure it out. The internet's got me. That's true. The internet's so many streaming services now. I must be able to find it somewhere. Right. Yeah. You're not uh, in that Godzilla uni- you app. <laughs> <You're> not- <laughs> you're not- yeah. I mean, look. At this point, I feel like there's enough content that. It, since it seems like their intention uh, is to continue making Godzilla movies, and I don't yeah. necessarily mean the the Hollywood productions, but it seems like the, in in Japan the intention is to keep making these in one yeah. form or another. You keep adding content. I mean, no. If if Toho was like, "Yo, we're gonna have our own streaming platform," I'd be like, "Yeah, I'm into it." They they created enough content to right, like fill it up. No, right. They did things other than Godzilla. Right. Although, yes, there's a lot of giant monster stuff. Yes. But that's all I would watch. That I'd watch the uh, the animated series with Godzuki. Oh boy, Godzuki. that's be that'd be it. And then sometimes I'd see if I'd like check if they have the uh, 1998 version, and then I'd be like, they don't still because they hate it. Cool. I'm honestly very much looking forward to working my way back around to the 1998 Godzilla. Because when it came out, obviously, you know what the, the general reaction to 98 Godzilla was and still is for the most part. Yes. Was I was not capable of getting anywhere near as upset as some other people because I didn't have the frame of reference some other people did. Right. I went, oh, it sure seems like a lot of people are really mad about this movie. I uh-huh. I want to see now how my perception of that film changes having seen all of the Godzilla films that precede it. Right. Um, I mean, the main thing I remember, even as a kid, was that it was two acts too long. Like, we get to a, a, a third act, and then just like, it's like, oh, there's like an hour left of this. And you're like, okay, well, I guess I guess we're going for a ride. Because um, it, it definitely, uh, someone like Ro- Roland Emmerich was the guy who made it. Mm-hmm. Um, you could definitely feel him being like, I've watched other movies. And you're going to see them in this movie. <laughs> um, all right. Well, guys, let us know what you think. Uh, you can hit us up on our Twitter, which is Missing Outcast, M I S S I N G O U T C A S T. Uh, if you've had a chance to check out Godzilla or if you're on the fence, let us know and we'll convince you. Um, I mean, if you've listened this far and you haven't seen it, um, bro, you should be convinced by now. I don't know what to tell you. It's so good. Um, but if you also just want to hit us up on our regular social media, Lex, where can they find you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram at the Lex Michael. And you can find me at Tari J T U R I J A Y. So thanks again for joining us. It's been very wonderful talking about Godzilla. Make sure that you die with dignity. Uh, <laughs> Get your own oxygen destroyer yeah. from our online store that will definitely have and we'll definitely be selling those. Indeed. Missing out oxygen destroyers. <laughs> uh, but until the next time we see you, this has been the retrospective that's introspective. And now you have a new perspective. 
on the level of indignity that you will experience when you die. 